Steve Matchett and I, back here at the Apex Collection. We were here well, a little while ago, and this collection up here is really phenomenal. The last time we were here, you were impressed with this collection. What about this time? I am equally impressed, Bill. The last time we were here, there was a wonderful range of cars. American classics, European exotica, some big names too. But it was the condition, the overall restoration quality that really struck me. And it's exactly the same this time, just the same. Yeah, it might even be a little better as we get into this collection. Almost two dozen cars and a mystery car in this mystery location coming up a little later from our friends at Porsche. But right now, here comes part two of the Apex Collection. Stephen Jaguar's first venture into the ultra high performance supercar market is represented by this XJ220. This is a 1993, and you're our Anglo insider. And you have a little bit of a story about one of the men that made this car possible. Well, in a former life, I used to work for the Benetton Formula One team, and literally just up the road from our factory in Oxfordshire was the TWR factory for Tom Walkinshaw Racing. And at that time, Tom Walkinshaw was our engineering director, and he was at the same same time producing this incredible machine as he was working with Benetton. Very different concept and the car originally slated to have a V12 that fell away and ended up with a V6. You know more about that V6 than I do. Enlighten me. Yeah, it's a rover sourced V6 twin turbo, uh, 542 horsepower out of a V6, pretty good. And at one time, this was the fastest production car in the world. Wow. 92, 93, yeah. 213 miles an hour, five speed transaxle. Some rarity here too, only 282 of these XJ220s were built. A limited number, and I have to say, Bill, that this Jaguar looks very different to many I've seen in the past, but I do see a connection. If we look at the headlamp covers on the 220 and then turn to our left to the Jaguar to your left, there's a connection. Exactly, some family resemblance. This is a 1967 E-Type, XKE, of course, and uh, that has a six-cylinder in it. This has a six-cylinder in a different six-cylinder. This is the Jaguar built inline six with 265 horsepower. It's got the four-speed manual. Everyone loves having a manual in a Jag, but it's the cosmetics of this car that really strikes you, doesn't it? It is a beautiful creation from Jaguar, no doubt. And I love the color. At first glance, it almost looks black but it's actually a real deep midnight blue or an indigo blue. I love the red interior and of course the roof which matches the color scheme of the car. Yeah, and you know what? I'm gonna let you say Jaguar because at least you didn't say Jaguar. <laughs> Well, Bill, last time we were here at the Apex Collection, we were treated to an exquisite convertible gold LS6 Chevelle. And surprise, surprise, here is another beautiful Chevelle. It's another LS6. It's gold. This one is a hard top. But more than that, this is also a pilot car. Can you enlighten me? I sure can. It's a prototype. This is something that manufacturers do. They're thinking about some changes to the equipment, to the options, even the color scheme sometimes. Right. And they'll build a few pilot cars. And if those changes seem to work out, it'll go into production. This car is so special in so many ways. First of all, at the Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals in Chicago, it won the gold certification, which is a pretty big thing. But it does have the LS6 454, 450 horse engine. This one with an automatic transmission, but it's got the 12 bolt rear end, pause attraction, and of course the gold color makes it stand out as well. But this isn't the only special Chevelle in this collection now, is it? No, because here is another beautiful example. This is a convertible Chevelle. This is also a very, very special car, right? Oh yeah, this is a 1970 SS396. This is even more rare than the LS6 wow. over here because they build fewer of these with the L78 375 horse 396 and four speed in a convertible red on red color scheme. A uh, lot of eye candy here. So on the Chevelle Collectometer, this one is pretty high. And Steve, how about four mega collectible Corvettes in the Apex collection? 1966 427 Coupe, and this is the big guy. And a little extra gingerbread here. It's got the optional knockoff wheels, side exhaust, and gold striped tires. And yep, it's a four-speed. This was the first year for the 427 in the Corvette. 
And in 1965, the year earlier, it was the first year for the big block in the Corvette. But it was a 396 big block with 425 horsepower. And this maroon car, no side exhaust, no extra exterior fun, but this car is a real monster. Four speed all the way. 2004 commemorative Corvette. Why is it commemorative? Well, this was the last year for the C5 generation, and the previous two years, the Corvette was a class winner at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, 2002 and 2003. So to mark that, yep, a commemorative Corvette. Well, while we're talking about the 24 Hours of Le Mans, how about that 2007 Ron Fellows American Le Mans Series GT1 class champion Z06 Corvette? Yep, Ron had seven podiums in Le Mans, and uh, two years he was the class winner. And this car sort of celebrates all his accomplishments for the Corvette brand. Very special car. Plenty of reminders on the outside that Ron Fellows was one of the greatest drivers in Corvette history, including his name, which is embossed on those red stripes on the front fender. Well, right here, Bill, I'm looking at a GT500 Super Snake from 2011. It is clearly a monster of a car with a lot going on. Tell me about it. Yeah, here's what you did back in 2011. You had your GT500 that you got from your Ford dealer, right. and you sent it out to Shelby, and for $35,000, they would convert it to the Super Snake. Put about 800 horsepower in it, tweak the suspension, give you a lot of visual Super Snake logos on the interior, some on the outside, and uh, this is a car that definitely instills fear in anybody who knows what it is. It's a beautiful machine. Now, here's a machine I am more familiar with, the GT350, H, which I understand stands for Hurt, but what I'm not familiar with is this color scheme, because all the others I've seen are gold on black, not this one, clearly. You are so perspicacious, that is correct. <laughs> they were mostly black with gold stripes. Out of the thousand that were built, less than 100 wound up with the Wimbledon white and the gold stripes, but mechanically, again, 289, about uh, 306 horsepower. This one with the automatic transmission, which most of them had. But this one, look at the condition of this car. This looks like it's 1966 all over again. It's absolutely beautiful. And talking about absolutely beautiful, here we are at a 65 GT350. No gold on the exterior of this car, Bill, but I suspect gold plays a part of this car's history. Yeah, it won gold at the Shelby American Automobile Club convention. And that's not easy to do because those guys are picky, picky, picky. This one, again, looks just like it did when it rolled from the Shelby factory. Yep. This one has those beautiful five-spoke wheels on all four corners, the Wimbledon white with the Le Mans blue stripes all the way across the car, a four-speed, which all the 65s had, and it was a race car, basically, that wound up on the street. This is a street version, but you know, those competition versions of this car, they won three straight SECA B production championships. So this thoroughbred right here has a great history behind it. Well, Bill, we have reached Camaro Boulevard, but this is no boulevard of broken dreams because we are surrounded by the most beautiful four Camaros I have ever seen. Now, I've owned three first generation Camaros and loved every one of them, but None of them were in this condition. Tell me about it. Yeah, and they're all different, too. Let's start with the 69 Camaro back there. That's a resto mod. It's Hugger Orange, upgraded powertrain, Boyd's wheels, looks beautiful, but nothing like this Copo Camaro. This 69 Camaro here is one of those famous Copo cars, central office production order. You couldn't get a 427 from the factory in a Camaro back in 69, but the Don Yanko, he kind of hip-checked the rules a little bit, got Chevy to put that big L72 427 in the Camaro. This one with an automatic transmission. You get a four-speed, too. This, this is rare. This is a 69 Camaro Indianapolis 500 pace car, but it's a Z10. It's a hard top. The Z11 was the convertible. Ah. Now, basically, they're the same as the convertible. However, notice the interior on the convertibles. You could only get that orange houndstooth. You could get a different color houndstooth like this one. It's white in there. This one has the 350 horse 396 too, which makes it a little extra special with an automatic transmission. And at the very end of Camaro Boulevard, Bill, we find what is arguably one of the most desirable, most collectible first-generation Camaros ever manufactured. 
Now I'm aware of Baldwin motion performance, even on the other side of the Atlantic. I know you're all over it. Educate me on that. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Massachusetts, one of my dreams was to see a real Baldwin motion car. Now they made Camaros, they made Chevelles, they made Corvettes, and this is a real Baldwin motion performance 1969 Camaro. But let's not stop there. Let's talk a little bit about the motion performance story. A guy by the name of Joel Rosen, his partner Marty Shore, they were an extension of Baldwin Chevrolet in Long Island, New York. And they could take any Chevy and turn it into an absolute monster of the midway. To do that with this car, they installed an LS7 454, well over 500 horsepower, 600 pound-feet of torque, rock crusher four-speed transmission. And the thing is, it's the only known Baldwin Motion Camaro with that powertrain. Daytona yellow, black interior, and the restoration on this car, well, you can see just how much perfection this car has from bumper to bumper. It takes my breath away. You always wanted to see one as a kid. And here it is. Yeah, and I may be seeing the only one that was ever built like this. A little earlier, you may remember, I mentioned we would have a mystery car from our friends at Porsche. Here it is, a 1987 Porsche 959. Stephen, you're looking a little flush. I am so, so excited. Bill, a little earlier on, you said that one of your childhood dreams was to see a genuine Baldwin motion performance car, and you've done that today. Well, I'm going to tell you one of my dreams from the 1980s when I was working with Ferrari in England was to see the great 959. It was the competition to the car that I was working on, the Ferrari F40. Both of those great cars going for the 200 mile an hour plus award. What Porsche did with this car is beyond incredible. Six cylinder engine, but with sequential turbochargers, which did away with that dreaded turbo lag. But not only did they produce an incredible piece of engineering, unlike the F40, it looks like Porsche customers also get comfort. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, you know, this really was the it car of the 1980s. I can remember when this car came out. It was on the cover of every magazine. Everybody was talking about it. and. Uh, when the journalists finally got a chance to drive this car, the one thing they said was, it's fast, but it has comfort, if you can believe that, all the way up to almost 200 miles an hour. 444 horsepower, six-speed Getrag manual transmission, all the fun things for the enthusiasts, but definitely a seven-figure car. It is beautiful. I am so very, very thrilled to see it today. I can't tell you. And let's not forget how rare this car is. We hardly ever get a 959 at Amiga Auction. Well, they only made 292 of them. And you know what? The Apex collection is so vast, there are a lot of cars we haven't even seen yet, such as a 1990 454 SS Chevy Silverado pickup with only nine miles on it. Got a couple of really trick Broncos, got an original 383 Cube Cuda. Oh, let's not forget the 1974 Pantera. We haven't got to that yet. I'm telling you, there's going to be quite a party in Kissimmee in January, thanks to the Apex collection. And if you can't be there in person, hope you'll join us live on Motor Trend Television and Motor Trend Plus. Steven, I think you need to back up a little bit. You're getting a little too close to this. <laughs>